in early 2006, my mother and I were in Target in the stationary aisle, and she picked up a fountain pen and started waxing nostalgic and started telling me the story about how much she loves fountain pens. Uh, she used to be an English teacher, and every year at the beginning of the school year, she would buy herself a brand new silver fountain pen. Now, because her birthday was upcoming and because when she was telling this, this memory seemed like it meant a lot to her, I made a mental note about it and then went back to Target and bought that silver fountain pen for her for her upcoming birthday. Uh, a few days later, I thought of a much better birthday gift, stuck the fountain pen in my drawer, and completely forgot about it. So my mother, Patty, was a uh, very sweet uh, little red-haired lady, a uh, little fun little uh, spitfire. And uh, she was a single mother, divorced since I was 10, and I was her only child. And even though we fought, like mothers and sons do, there was, uh, we genuinely liked and loved each other. Uh, no doubt about it. Now, what I'm about to say, I don't want to affect the tone or the mood of this story, but uh, the reason that this birthday was so significant was the fact that it was going to be her last and we knew this beyond a shadow of a doubt. A few months earlier, she had been diagnosed as terminal, given six months to a year left to live, and she asked me to come home and help her through it. Uh, I said yes. I turned down a dream job that I had worked really hard to get that was about to start in a few weeks, and I went home to live with her for what would ultimately be her final five months. When I got home, we made a verbal agreement to each other that we both knew this was going to be very difficult, but we decided that we said out loud to each other that we were in this together until the end, that we had to make the best out of whatever time we had left. And because this was her last birthday, I wanted to make sure that it was perfect. So I thought to myself that the gift I'm going to give her needs to be handmade. That's going to be a lot more uh, from the heart. But I had no idea what that was going to be. So one Saturday morning, I went to a Michael's craft store, got really stoned in my car, walked inside, and discovered scrapbooking. <laughs> it was awesome. I bought myself a beautiful colo book. Uh, I got a bunch of construction paper, a couple crinkly scissors, you know, the works. Uh, went home, locked myself in my room, went through 35 years of photographs, and when I emerged not to use a Trump-like level of hyperbole, but it was the greatest scrapbook that had ever been made. Now, the day of her birthday arrives, and we do everything that her heart desires. We go to the beach, we look for seashells, we go to her favorite restaurant, and she loved the scrapbook as much as I hoped she would. And the last stop of the day was to go to a local bookstore to see historical fiction author David Liss talk about his book, The Conspiracy of Paper. Now, to be very honest with you, I had absolutely no interest in watching historical fiction author David Liss talk about his book, The Conspiracy of Paper. So right as we were about to walk in, my phone rings, and it is one of my best friend's uh, former co-worker who was calling me. Patty was cool with the fact that I took the call, and she went inside to go watch David Liss talk about his book, The Conspiracy of Paper. Now, Matt had called me to give me some inside information that the dream job that I had turned down was still holding a spot for me for one more week. And this news shook me, and it shocked me because I thought that was a done deal. And it was at that moment when I knew that it was still out there that my life as I knew it and the way that I thought my life was going to be was done. And... I had to be here. My job was to take care of her now. I had an actual title, which was primary caregiver. And I had to be there. I couldn't leave. And as much as I realized this, that did not mean that I had to accept it immediately. On the drive home, Patty asked me why I was quiet. And I decided that the best way to answer this question was to throw a tantrum. And I started just going off like a child version of me about how this was so unfair and I could not believe that this was happening to me and that I had to give up so much and that everything was being taken away from me. And I punctuated this huge tantrum by saying, I just want my life back. To which Patty responded in a tone that I will never forget. So do I, Kevin. 
so do I. We were silent for the rest of the car ride home, and I had effectively ruined her last birthday. We get home. And I walk into my room, and I'm pissed at myself. I can't believe I had done that. I had started to come more to rational thought. And I went in my room, and I sat down in my office chair, and I just slammed my desk in frustration. And as I did that, the drawer opened up ever so slightly. And I looked inside, and I saw a silver, recta- or I saw a, a box, a little rectangular box. And it made me feel better. And I walked into the living room, and I apologized again. And I thanked her for listening to me. I just needed to be heard and I needed her to hear what I said and she was completely understanding and she was very cool about it and she told me that this was hard on both of us and she understood where I was coming from I thanked her again and I handed her the small rectangular box and when she opened it and she saw the silver fountain pen tears came to her eyes and she said thank you Kevin you listened to me You listened to me and you heard what I said. It's been a long time since anyone really listened to me. We hugged and I reminded her that we were in this together. And even though I had done my best to ruin her birthday, because we listened to each other and heard what the other had to say, her last birthday was, as I hoped it would be, perfect. Thank you very much. Kevin McGeehan, ladies and gentlemen.